Hey guys, so this is the page that I am working on for you right now. And you'll notice just without reading you all of the information, because you can read. Um, here's the video that we looked at on Monday. If you weren't here, you definitely need to listen to that first. Um, because it's, it's much easier to figure out the meaning of everything by doing that instead of just reading the words off the page. So anyway, make sure you listen to that. Um, I guess somebody could play it for you in class if they wanted to, so that everybody could just listen to it at, at the same time. But anyway, for this assignment, you need the printed poem, which many of you have. I know I started this out as a group thing, and then as the day went on and as I went over some things with other classes, it seemed to be a little bit easier for people to do it on their own. So that's what we're going to switch to. So if you do not have the copy of the poem itself, then we have extra copies and we can always make extra copies. And I'm going to put a copy on here so you can look at it, like a link to it. So don't worry about any of that. So you're going to have the printed poem itself, the tone wheel that we've already looked at, and then the chart that has the acronym, the DIDLS, the D-I-D-L-S. You don't need the chart that you were starting to fill out. You just need the chart that has all the information. So what, this is what I'm talking about. You've got your tone wheel, which you've seen, and most of you have a copy of that. Then you've got the poem itself right here and the chart right here. The chart itself looks like this. And you'll notice that when I'm going through it, really briefly, I'm only going to talk about diction, imagery, details, and language. For this specific poem, we're not going to do structure and syntax because there really isn't anything to talk about. It started out as a spoken word poem that was just printed on paper. There's no punctuation. There's, you know, anybody could have broken the lines anywhere. So we're not going to worry about the structure and the syntax on this one. That can be for a different kind of poem. Okay, so let me just explain what it is you're going to do with this poem. You're going to look at the poem, read through it, and you're going to do these first four things, which are, like I just said, the diction, the imagery, the details, and the language. Diction simply means word choice. And I know we've talked about some of this on Monday, but several people were not here. And so let me just go over the whole thing again. Um, diction is word choice. It's the specific words that a poet or a writer or whoever has used. So we'll go to the poem here and let me just give you an idea of what I'm talking about. If we were going to talk about diction and the way it affects the meaning or the way it affects the tone, because specifically we were talking about tone the other day, how those words affect the tone. So let me just pull this one out. And I probably pulled illegible out the other day. I can't really remember. Um, but illegible is definitely a word that stands out. Because if you look at it, you know, we all know that illegible means that it's like, if you think about handwriting, if it's illegible, it can't be read. It's sloppy or it's messy or something is wrong with it that you can't actually read it or understand it. So if you take that word illegible and you put it in the context that it's in, um, bodies and genders like mine remain illegible. Now suddenly you're not talking about handwriting anymore. You're talking about a person. So she's not only talking about just anybody or any anybody's gender. She's talking about her own. So she is feeling illegible. She is misunderstood. She can't be seen. So when you take a word like illegible, and then you take a word like limbo, and then you put that together with this word, like erasure, we've erased you, um, you've got a whole different meaning than what those words mean alone. Limbo is somewhere in between. Erasure means something has been erased or, or it's disappeared, it's no longer visible. And illegible means you can't understand it. But when you put all three of those things together and you realize that a person is talking about herself, then that's when the meaning comes out and you, you should be, oh, okay. So this person is feeling like they don't belong and they're feeling invisible and they're feeling like they're totally misunderstood. So 
Hopefully that helps. And that's how you would do diction. Now there's a lot more words you could choose. There are two full pages and, and, a, and a little bit left. So there are several words. You could probably make a 20 word list if you tried really hard to, to kind of go through and figure out how those words work together to create the meaning, which is what you want to be able to do when you're doing the actual written assignment. So let's go back to the chart. Now you have imagery. Examine the images that the author creates. A lot of students find that this phrase stands out, set skin on fire. So when you think about setting skin on fire, that's an image. It's not necessarily a visual image. It's more of a, like a feel image, like a touch image, because what would it feel like for your skin to be set on fire? It would hurt, but we're not actually talking about setting someone's skin on fire. We're talking about words that someone's mother used to set their skin on fire, which simply means that they're hurt by whatever their mother said. So you have that image. You have all kinds of different images. Um, a burning heart for the pain she iron cast against me. There's this whole dream that she has, and I won't go into all the details of it, but maybe concentrate on that as an image. All right, the details. Most students the last couple of days have looked at the title as far as one of the details and its significance. Because if you look at how that title is worded, it says on not forgiving my mother. And then in parentheses, you have the word not. So if you take that out, it's on forgiving my mother. So is she forgiving her mother? Is she not forgiving her mother? What does that mean? The parentheses, does that mean we're still trying to make a decision? We're not sure about how we're going to do it. So there could be a lot of, there's a lot of things going on. You can talk about whatever you think that means, and that will be just fine. As far as other details, the central claim could be something you could talk about. What is the central claim? There's probably two or three different things you could come up with. I think we probably would all agree that one of the main claims she is making is that she feels invisible and misunderstood and not not a real person to a lot of people especially her mother and there's different um different claims but that's one of the main ones so anytime you kind of get stuck and you're not sure what to what to explain you've got these questions that run down the right side for each section so make sure that you kind of address you don't have to address all of them but they can give you a place to start for language there's not a whole lot of different kinds of things. There are a couple of similes. So if we scroll on down, um, a feminine body ever stops feeling illegible, like bad handwriting on a birth certificate. That's a simile. There's just not a whole lot of that. It's way more straightforward than a lot of poetry, as you can tell. And again, like I said, we're not going to worry about the structure and syntax. Okay. So you need to spend I would say a good five minutes on diction, five minutes on imagery. So if you spend about 20 minutes working through those four things, the diction imagery, details and language, taking notes on the poem, highlighting things, writing, writing what you think about it and how you think it affects the meaning, then you get into the actual written assignment. Okay, so your actual assignment is right here. It's more like a writing prompt, but it just says analyze how two of the following devices help to create and affect the overall meaning of the poem. So you're going to choose two of the four things that you spent time on while you were looking through the poem. So diction, imagery, details, language. So you might choose to examine and analyze diction and details or language and Im imagery, or diction and imagery, or, or whatever two that you want to do. The actual assignment that you turn in will be two full paragraphs. I would suggest five to seven sentences each. I probably would suggest even more because what you're going to do is provide the topic sentence and then you're going to provide the evidence to explain your topic sentence and then you're going to want to explain even more so don't don't try to cut it short and then not actually say what you really need to say 
You are welcome to use the following topic sentences. Obviously, you're going to want to fill these blanks in with whichever two of these that you chose. So to begin, and you're going to write this on your own paper with a pen or a pencil. Don't, don't put it in your drive and share it with me or anything like that. So you could say, in Chris Tran's poem on not forgiving my mother, the speaker uses whatever to create meaning. So you can start out with diction or imagery or details or language. And then the rest of that paragraph needs to give examples from the poem, needs to explain, you know, how those examples create the meaning, how they affect the meaning, how they affect the tone. And this is where you can go back to your tone wheel and really try to narrow down what the tone is and what the author is giving you. Remember the tone is the author's and the speaker's feelings. The mood is yours. So we're not worried about the mood just yet. We're just talking about the tone. Then once you're finished with that first paragraph, you can move down to the second one. You don't want to, you know, say the exact same thing. So another device that affects meaning in the poem is, and then you choose your second device from up there at the top of the list. And you do the same thing with that one. And that is all you do. You do not need an introduction or a conclusion or anything in between. Just those two paragraphs. Make sure they say everything they need to say. Don't just count five sentences and call it done. If it hasn't, if you haven't been able to explain everything, that's not the point of the writing is to get five sentences. The point of the writing is to explain what you mean and explain also what the speaker means in the poem. So I think now you have everything you need, all the information um, and the poem, the tone wheel, the chart, the video, you can watch as many times as you want. You can listen to this video on your own just to make sure you've got all the directions and you understand what's going on. If you need help with it or you don't understand something, just go ahead and shoot me an inbox message. I am going to be driving a lot so I'll get to it as soon as I can. And um, don't leave your work in the classroom. Take all of your papers with you. Take what you write, take the stuff that you took your notes on, all the sheets that you happen to have, take them with you. Um, work on the two paragraphs and then bring them back with you on Friday and you will turn them in and we'll talk about it a little bit more, especially if you have questions, if you get stuck on something. All right. Have a great day. Bye guys.